Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and thank you for joining us on this Amatex Solid State Controls uh, webinar into understanding Amatex uh, SCI schematic drawings. Um, if you could please uh, put in the chat bar uh, while we wait for everybody to arrive, whether you can hear me loud and clear or not. Um, I don't know if my settings are exactly the way that they need to be. So if you could let me know that you can hear me, that would be appreciated. I'm just turning up my microphone a little bit. Um, let's have a look. Loud and clear. Thank you very much, Jason. Appreciate that. So while we wait for everybody to join us, um, we will do a little bit of introductions. Uh, my name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager for Amatex Solid State Controls, and I'm based in the Stafford, Texas office, which is just south of Houston. Um, I have over 20 years in the industrial UPS industry. I've worked for um, with many different manufacturers, and um, for the last six years, I've worked with Amatex Solid State Controls. Um, there will be a lag of around 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and me seeing anybody type something in the chat bar or in the Q&A. So um, basically Webinar Jam has to take this live webinar and it has to process it and turn it into uh, an iOS stream, into a, uh, a desktop stream and a, an Android stream. And it takes a little bit of processing time to do that. So, and that's about 10 seconds. So what I tend to do is if you have a question, type it in when um, it comes to mind. And then I'll probably leave all of the questions and answers until the end of the webinar. Um, but if there is something pertinent and I do see it while I'm going through a slide, I will try and answer it if possible. But don't think I'm ignoring you. If I don't answer your question, I will leave it right until the end. And on that note as well, it's much better if you put, if you go into the chat bar on your right hand side, there is a chat tab and there is a Q&A tab. If you have a question, then it's much better if you put it in the Q&A tab, because then I can go through at the end and go through it that way. Uh, also, Webinar Jam has a panic button. That's the platform that we use for uh, producing this webinar. And what that means is if I get some comments and you can't hear me or you can't see the presentation anymore or something goes wrong with the webinar, I can press that panic button. Everybody will be removed from this meeting. A new meeting will be um, instantly created. Everybody will be invited in there and uh, we will carry on from where we left off. OK, um, one of the most popular questions that we get is, will the webinar be recorded? And the answer to that question is yes. Webinar Jam does record this webinar. And since you have um, registered for the webinar, you will get a link once the webinar is completed that you can go back and uh, you can review the webinar. The problem with the webinar jam recording is it's treated as a brand new webinar, basically. Once you press play, you can't fast forward and rewind it to your favorite parts. Um, it just plays. So what our fantastic um, marketing team do is they take that recording, download it from the webinar server, webinar jam server, and they turn it into an MP4 and then upload that into our, our tech SCI YouTube page. And that way you can go in, you can share it, you can uh, pause, rewind, fast forward, do whatever you need to do uh, to get to where you want to be. It's much better on our YouTube page. And if you go to the YouTube page that uh, I think Brooke has just put in the chat menu, she has, then all of our other webinars are on there as well. We don't delete them. They're open to the public and you can share them. You can go and view them whenever you want. So uh, everything that we do gets put on our YouTube page and you can go back and watch them at your leisure. Okay, so that should be everybody that's joined us. Oh yeah, and the webinar should last around one hour, but that depends on how much I speak. And as I say, on every webinar, I try to keep it to an hour, but I do tend to go down rabbit holes sometimes and it takes a little bit longer. So I will try to stay on track. So the learning outcomes, 
that we hope you will get today are uh, we hope you'll be able to understand the most common symbols used in the Amatec SEI schematic, understand the flow of an Amatec SEI uh, schematic drawing, um, specifically for a UPS, understand the role semiconductors play in power conversion, understand the power flow through the schematic, how the actual power flows through the schematic, uh, discuss in very general terms, the role of each control board and how it plays in the system, and then discuss how the alarm monitors uh, work for the system. Hopefully we will get through more of that. So we're going to start off with the, um, the, the microferro UPS. This is our ferroresonant UPS. It's the workhorse of our um, factory. Um, it's been changed um recently into the dsc which is a digital uh version of this uh where we have the same screen on this as our modern dpp but this drawing here will give you an idea of how the ferroresonant systems work not the pulse width modulation we'll get to that uh, in a moment so you can see here this um is the first page that you'll get in the drawing package and there's a lot of information on there um we're going to break each part of this down. Um, so in the bottom right hand corner, if you see that's this portion down here, I'm going to expand that so you can see it. Um, you'll get all the details for that system. OK, and you can see that this is the outline drawing and it's for a 10 kVA UPS and SE is a designator for a, a micro ferro system. Um, and it's a 480 volt input. The DC is 105 to 140 volts DC, and the output is 120 volts, 60 hertz, single phase. OK, this is sheet one of two. So there is a second sheet that goes along with this. You can see all the approval details here. This was manufactured in 2014. But most importantly, I like to tell everybody is the project number is the serial number. And if you ever contact Amatex solid state controls with an issue or you need parts or anything to do with any of your systems. All of our filing is done by the project or the serial number, every single part of it. That is how we search for everything. If you give us the model number or the the name that you give the UPS, let's say boiler house UPS or whatever, it's going to make us make it very difficult for us to find it in our system. But if you give us a serial number, we'll be able to find that job file pretty much immediately with all the drawings, the manuals and everything in there so we can help you out um, just that little bit better. So uh, if you do call us up or make any communications with us, make sure you have the serial number for the system. OK. And then on the outline drawing, it tells you everything about the front panel. Um, and you can see E1, this meter here, that's labeled as the inverter output frequency meter. Uh, V301 here is this one here, which is the DC output voltmeter. Um, and then it also lists the breakers here. So B4 is the bypass source AC input breaker. B1 here is the battery input breaker. And B301 over here is the AC input breaker. So it's very easy for you to go on the outline page and see what the designation of each of those breakers are. And then also on that outline page, there is a basically a single line drawing of the system. And uh, this has some good information on there for you, uh, especially for the engineers out there. So for example, on the, on the AC input, um, you can see here that it tells us that the maximum AC input current that we're going to see is 24.4 amps. So therefore, that lets you design um, the breaker in the bucket that feeds this UPS and the cable size is required to go from that bucket to the UPS. So that is the maximum current draw that our UPS will see is 24.4 amps for this particular system. And then you'll also see uh, we give you the DC rating um, as well. So you can see here that the max current for DC is going to be 112 amps for this system. So you would have to 
put suitable cables to go between the UPS and the battery that can handle 112 amps. And then finally, on the output, we have uh, a maximum current of 83.3 amps, and you can see that it is single phase and ground, so you'd have to run a single phase and ground cable for the bypass supply. And for the AC output, it's also single phase, line to neutral and ground uh, at 83.3 amps. One thing I didn't, I forgot to notice about the AC input over here is we do not run a neutral to the AC input of any of our UPS systems. Um, the input to the rectifier is a delta transformer. We do not need a neutral. We don't have anywhere for you to land a neutral. So when you run a cable into our UPS, it should be um, a three core cable with a ground run. Okay, no neutral. Okay. And then on that same, uh, actually this could be page two, if I remember correctly. We have a Mimic. That is actually identical to the push buttons and LEDs that are on the system. We have our connection terminals here, and then we have our alarm terminals here. And we'll go into those in detail here. So this is the connections. Um, and it, these on the microfarad system are usually at the bottom of the cabinet. And it shows you here, we have our AC input and it's A phase, B phase, and C phase. And it tells you up here what the size of that hole on the bus bar is. And uh, obviously you can put a single lug and run a cable going in that way there. Or if necessary, you can have a two hole lug going um, uh, like that. Whatever you need to do, um, but the whole spacing is listed up here. Okay, that's for the AC input. And once again, you can see there is no terminal to land a neutral. So do not run a neutral to our system. And the next one is the battery input. Please pay very close attention to the positive and negative on here. Um, it is extremely important. If you reverse these polarities when you're installing a new UPS, um, then you can cause damage to the UPS itself. Um, so please always make sure when you land these cables, you are landing positive and negative on the correct terminals, okay? And then on the right-hand side, we have our neutral is here. Once again, you've got the whole size and spacing um, here. And then for the hot or the line um, for a single phase system, that would be connected to that terminal there. That's the AC output. And then the hot for the bypass would be connected there. And then the neutral for the bypass would probably be connected there. And the neutral, uh, actually, let me clarify that. The neutral for both of the systems, so whether that is the bypass or the AC output, you would put one terminal on the front and one terminal on the back of that bus bar for the neutral for both of these, okay? So you would run it like that. Hopefully that makes sense. And then you would connect the ground to your ground uh, conductor. And then we have our alarm connections here. This is inside the UPS. Um, it's uh, our alarm, uh, sorry, our alarm relay board. And um, these are the terminals that you would uh, connect to. And it says in here, uh, reference sheet two of the inverter schematic for the name tag arrangement. So on sheet two, we'll get to in just a moment, it tells you which um, terminal is the alarms, normally closed, common, and normally open. Um, and gives you information on how to connect your alarm terminations. Okay. And the last part of that sheet drawing was the mimic panel. And this is identical, like I said, to what's actually on front on the front of the UPS. So S301, that's a push button for float. S302 is a push button for equalize. S201 is the push button for inverter to load. 
and S202 is the push button for bypass to load. If inverter to load is on, you will have a green LED. If bypass to load is on, you will have an amber LED. And for the battery charger, if you're in float mode, you will have green here. And if you are in equalized mode, you will have an amber light here. This section here is where all of the custom alarms can go. On this system here, we only have uh, three alarms listed, but depending on what the engineers buy, you can have many more UPS, uh, many more alarms on the front of that panel. Um, from one UPS to another, they're all gonna be different because they are all custom spec. Okay, but it tells you here that that's a red, a red and a red. Um, we have a red LED here. If um, the alarm for the system detects that the voltage has dropped and uh, the battery is supplying load, then this LED will come on. Um, this is the only thing that I, I'm not particularly a fan of, um, that what we do. For the battery input breaker, this green LED will come on if it is open. Okay, um, I would have preferred that to be an amber LED. If you open the battery input breaker, it would be amber. But for some reason, the factory um, decided that it would be better to be green. Um, let me just see, is there anything else I want to discuss on there? Uh, no, just the positions of <clears throat> the, uh, the meters. So it shows you voltmeter, ammeter, frequency meter, voltmeter, and ammeter there, okay? And then this is where our bypass supply comes in. So now we're gonna get down into the nitty gritty of the actual schematic diagram uh, for this UPS. Um, so this is page uh, one for the, page one of one for the charger. So they're saying for the charger section, there is only one sheet. Okay, once again, we've got our serial number down here. And in the bottom left hand corner, you can see it's not very clear here. So on the next page, I'm going to expand it. It tells you all the wire sizes. So everywhere in our drawing, every wire number is followed by a letter. And these are the letters that designate what size of cable it is. So if it was wire number 11J, then you would go here and you would see that J is equal to a number two cable. Okay, if it was an L, it would be a one alt cable. So this is a very easy reference for you um, to see what cable sizes it should be inside the system. Uh, another note, all unmarked control wires will be uh, 22 gauge or number 22. Um, and then there's also some other designations. If you see these sig symbols next to a cable, it tells you uh, whether it's an isolated cable, an isolated twisted pair. This designates a tie point, and this designates just a twisted pair, not an isolated twisted pair. Okay. So now we will actually walk through the schematic for the charger. So on this side of the drawing here, this is where our three phase 480 uh, comes in. Okay. And then it goes to breaker B301. Okay. So that is the AC input breaker. So A phase, B phase, and C phase then go into this delta transformer. That's why we don't need a neutral because we have a delta input on our rectifier. And we're going to have 480, A to B, B to C, and C to A. And also our uh, rectifier inputs are not phase rotation sensitive. Okay. Bypass. Uh, input is, don't get confused with the two, but our AC input for the rectifier is not phase rotation sensitive, okay? The secondary of this transformer here is a star or a Y transformer, and that steps down the voltage to a suitable level for 
uh, us to create the correct DC for this system. So I can see here that this is listed as a 130 volt DC system. So I know because I'm the senior technical manager that basically you're going to get around about 130 volts phase to phase on the secondary of this transformer. Okay, it, it's stepping it down, it's giving us isolation. There is no electrical connection between the delta and the uh, the delta primary and the uh, star y secondary. So we have isolation um, and we are also stepping down uh, the voltage. That voltage then goes on wire 357, 376, I think, and 361. Uh, it's not absolutely clear, but that goes into these fuses here. Fuse 301, fuse 303, and fuse 302. Okay. And if you know anything about fuses, fuses are always placed downstream of what they're trying to protect. So these fuses are not going to protect anything in this area here. Okay. That's not their purpose. These fuses are only here to protect the system from anything on this side of the, the rectifier bridge. OK, and in truth, they are there to try and protect these SCRs. OK. That is why the fuses are there. So then those fuses go into these type points here which is into our full wave rectifier bridge, okay? And then we have six SCRs that convert the AC on this side into DC on this side. So um, it is quite simple. If you took a, a multimeter and you measured on these, these two points here, you would get DC, and if you took a multimeter and you measured on these two points here, you would get AC. This is where the conversion between AC and DC happens. And we use SCRs. That is what that symbol that I have circled, these six symbols here, that's what it is. It is an SCR. You can see at the top of the page we have X302, which is the charger control board, and that's what tells the SCRs when to turn on. Okay. Um, basically, it's monitoring the input into the system here. So this is where it gets its uh, reference signal from the AC uh, input. And then what it does using um, the magic of this control board, it says, okay, using feedback, I'm going to control the uh, phasing of these SCRs each individually using these gate signals um, here. So you can see these three gate signals are going to the top three SCRs. And then obviously, you know, the engineering team could have drawn cables all the way down here to the bottom SCRs, but that would make the drawing very messy. So what they've done is here on the bottom three SCRs, they've labeled them as 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. And you can see 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. That is the gate signals for those bottom SCRs. Okay. This U symbol here is what's called a quench arc. And basically, it's there as um, it's kind of like a snubber, it's just a capacitor and a resistor in series. Um, it's there to snub out any uh, spikes um, that could cause the SCRs to turn on um, when they shouldn't. Okay. Uh, and they also um, allow, it protects the SCRs as well from uh, high raise in voltage or high rise in, it's basically it's DVI, to DT, sorry, DV by DT and DV, DI by DT. We're trying to prevent 
switch one of these SCRs accidentally by uh, a sharp increase in voltage, which tends to happen when you turn the, the rectifier on for the first time. Uh, so that's really what they are there for. They're just snubbers. Okay. Then our DC comes out here and goes through this device here, which is labeled as G301. G301 is a shunt. Um, and basically a shunt converts a uh, current signal. So current flows through that shunt. It's a precision resistor is what it does and turns it into a voltage. And that voltage is proportional to the current and goes up to the control board on these two terminals here. And that's how we limit the current to our system using uh, current feedback. And then we have these terminals, two terminals here, which is the voltage feedback. So this is our positive and negative. This is the voltage feedback going into these terminals on the control board. And that tells the control board what the output voltage is and the charging control board will do its necessary uh, adjustments to make sure it stays at the level that we have set it. Okay, uh, we also have our voltmeter here, which is protected by this fuse. And then we have K304 contact. This contact here is uh, fed from this coil for the relay here. You can say K304, K304, they're both the same. And basically what it's saying is we need to have power going to this transformer for that coil to energize. When that coil energizes, this contact closes and allows the feedback signal to get back up to the board. So it's saying, basically it's giving permission for the charger control board to fire the SCRs. If we don't have power here, then we this K304 will be open, feedback will not get back to the board and therefore we won't send signals to the SCRs. So, um, that is the purpose of K304. If we have a failure of AC, um, then we don't want the charger control board to uh, continue firing SCRs that are not active because it drain it will drain uh, the battery just a little bit more. So that's why we have K304 in there. And then we have our inductor or our choke. L301, which is part of the filter circuit, um, which helps lower the ripple um, voltage of the output of the charger. And then we also have our output fuse on this system here, which remember this fuse here will not blow if something in here fails. It will only blow if something out here fails. So basically if we had a direct short between positive and negative on the output, then this fuse would blow to try uh, uh, and protect the system from feeding into a short. The last thing I didn't discuss was this uh, circuit over here, but this is your float and equalize uh, potentiometers that are inside the system. That is how you set your float voltage and your equalize voltage. And then we also have, this system has uh, a timer uh, for equalize. So if you press the equalize button, you can have it set for let's say 96 hours. And then after 96 hours, the system will return to float mode. Okay. So that's the basics of the microfarad chargers. And now here is the basics of the microfarad inverter. Um, once again, this drawing here is a little bit small. You can't see it very well. Um, but you can see we have all the details down here and it's saying that this is now page one of two. So for the inverter uh, section of this drawing package, there is going to be two pages, okay? It's for the same uh, serial number. We've got the same serial number down here, um, but we now have two pages for the inverter. So let's expand this first page so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. So first of all, you can see here, this is actually a little block diagram of the rectifier that we just discussed. Um, you can see here, that's the AC input into the rectifier and 36 and 35 is the 
positive and negative out of the rectifier. And if you follow the positive, it goes down onto this cable here. And if you follow the negative, it goes down onto this cable here. OK, so that's the charger connection to the inverter. And then we also have on this cable here, this is the battery input. So this is where your battery is connected out here. OK, once again, you have to make sure the positive and negative is correct on this system. And then we have B1, which is our battery input breaker. OK. So the battery is not connected to the charger until you close this breaker here. Now you will notice on the front of a microferro UPS, there is no inverter on push button, okay? Um, basically what happens is as soon as you close B1, the inverter will start. And that's um, enabled by, if I just follow the drawing, do, 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 do. it's been a while since I've done this presentation. This one here. OK, when it sees this contact here close, it sends a signal to the inverter static switch control board. And that tells the system to start sending signals to the inverter bridge. OK, so that is how the inverter starts. So um, there are some circumstances, obviously, that that's a mechanical that's a mechanical component and that's a mechanical component. So let's say the auxiliary contact doesn't close or there is a break in the wire between the auxiliary contact up to this control board. If we don't get a closed contact here, this inverter will never, ever start ever. OK, we have to have a closed contact at this portion here for the inverter to start. OK. So when we close this breaker, what that does is allows power to get in here. Now we have another choke inductor at uh, this point here for filtering. And we have our capacitor bank here, C1, for filtering also. OK, uh, the capacitor bank does have a resistor connected in parallel across it. And that is a discharge resistor. It's always in circuit. So if you did shut down the charger, shut down the battery, uh, the inverter would turn off and then this resistor would discharge the capacitors for you and make the, set, the system safe to work on um, after about five, 10 minutes, okay? And then the DC goes through F2. F2 is a semiconductor fuse and it is there to protect or to try and protect these IGBTs from failure, OK? So if F2 has blown, it tends to usually mean that one of the IGBTs has failed. And that's what Q1 and Q2 on this drawing is. Q1 is an IGBT. You can see it's drawn uh, like that the symbol going out like that but if i draw it down here you're probably more familiar with seeing it drawn this way up with an arrow going that way okay and it's an uh, an igbt which is an insulated gate bipolar transistor it's just a fancy word for a power switch you send a signal on the gate signal that's a collector and that's the emitter if you send a signal on this gate it's a voltage signal it does not um, transfer any current or very minimal current between the gate and the collector emitter. If you send a signal to the gate, it allows the collector and emitter to conduct and basically makes it a short. So no gate signal means it's open. And then when you get a gate signal, it is closed. It is basically just a power switch. That's all an IGBT is um, in our system. Okay. Connected to our IGBT is a snubber board, and it's doing the same. It's trying to protect the IGBTs from 
a high rate of change of voltage or current that could uh, damage the IGBTs and the IGBTs are actually very very sensitive devices so the snubber board is there to protect the IGBTs um, from damaging themselves due to uh, high rate of change of current or voltage going to them they're trying to snub out any uh, spikes okay and then if you follow it back up here this is where the gate drive signals go back to on our inverter stack switch control board that is where the signals come from to turn the igbts on and to turn them off okay now if you follow the current down here sorry the cable down here you will see that it goes to the center of this transformer this transformer here is the uh ferro resonant transformer okay this is where all the magic happens um, in our ferro systems all we do with an inverter static switch control board in a ferro system is tell the igbts to turn on and produce basically a square wave at 60 hertz in the us 50 hertz uh, in europe and other places okay all the control board does is say okay make a square wave there is no in the most basic scheme of things, there is no feedback on that signal. It just says, okay, I'm going to make a 60 or 50 hertz square wave based on the DC voltage coming in here. So for this system here, it's 135 volts float voltage. So that would be 135 volts and that would be 135 volts. Okay because we're switching the positive and the negative into uh, the primary of this transformer, okay? So if we switch Q1 on, you can see that the power flow will be down through here, down through this transformer, back, because we have to get back to the zero, to the negative, okay? So that would give us um, our... Well, it's a dot, the dots up there. So I think that gives us our negative going uh, portion. And then we turn Q1 off and we turn Q2 on and we follow the power down to that center tap of that transformer. And then it goes down through this way and gets back to the negative. Okay. And that completes the square wave. And that's all it does. On this side, it's very, very simple. Just a very basic square wave, okay? All of the regulation, current limiting, voltage regulation is inherently done within the ferroresonant transformer. The ferroresonant transformer has current limiting properties um, due to its design, and it also has voltage regulating properties. It's actually called a CVT, which is a constant voltage transformer. And what that means is I said that the square wave into here is going to have basically a 270 volt peak to peak voltage when the system is at full charge voltage for the battery. But remember, this battery can discharge when we have a power failure and it can actually go down to 105 volts so that means we could go down to a 210 volt peak to peak waveform so we can go from 210 volts to 270 volt square wave on the input of this transformer and then on the output we are going to have 120 volts ac and it's going to be a beautiful sinusoidal waveform because the transformer also gives uh, filtering um, to that square wave. So this wide range, 210 to 270, the output of this transformer will be 120 volts regardless of that range. OK, it's a constant voltage output transformer. OK. And then we have... Uh, it, frequency meter we have m1 is a fan uh, and v1 is a voltmeter and then that output goes out here through a fuse um, which is there to protect anything that happens down here 
So let's say we have a short circuit there, then that fuse would blow to protect the system. And the output goes into the inverter static switch. So this is the inverter static switch. And this is the bypass static switch. Don't get the uh, static switches and remote manual bypass switches or manual bypass switches mixed up. This is a static switch, which means there's no moving parts and it's done electronically. This actually is on the next page. There is a, uh, an MBS on this system, which is a, a rotary switch, which does have mechanical moving parts in it. This is what's called a static switch. And the inverter static switch should be in normal operation, should be on and allow power to flow out of the system. And then what we do have is a CT on the output of the system, which goes back to the control board, X2J5. So that goes back of this portion here and it tells the system if the inverter is overloaded and if the inverter is overloaded by 120 percent if the bypass is available and within tolerance it will tell the bypass static switch to turn on uh, to protect the system um, if there is a fault on the output here then that will clear and then you could press the inverter to load push button and it will go back to inverter once that fault is cleared. Okay, um, what else do we have? I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I possibly can because I'm running out of time already. Um, but -bum 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 -bum. We can see it's difficult for me because when I turn my whiteboard on, I don't see some of the drawing, but up here. I'm going to point an arrow to it and then it's going to disappear. Um, we have K4. K4 is um, basically a coil for a relay that gets energized when the DC voltage drops below 105 volts DC. Basically, we need to trip this breaker here if the voltage goes below 105 volts DC. And what happens is the inverter static switch control board is monitoring that voltage um, basically on these two terminals here. And when it sees it drop below 105, it energizes that relay. The, you can see here that then that closes K4, which allows this coil here, which is related to this breaker here, to energize and it will shunt trip that breaker to prevent us uh, to prevent the batteries from being over discharged what else on here that's really about it oh no one other thing we have uh these two uh z when you see z on one of our drawings that is a thermostat okay so that's mounted to a heat sink one will be mounted to the inverter heat sink and the other one will be mounted to the static switch heat sink it's just monitoring the temperature of that heat sink and uh, will perform an action if it goes above the temperature that it is uh, nominally designed for okay and page two shows you the um x2 uh, display alarm control board and we have our indicator alarm board here as well okay and this is where the buttons on the front of the UPS interacts we have a float equalize inverter to load and uh, bypass to load push buttons I think we expanded on this button here, on this page here yeah we do and uh, basically we send a signal out, it's actually a five volt DC signal and goes out on this cable here. And when you press the button, that allows that five volts to go back in the board here. And um, that's what tells this board here that the button has been pressed, okay? And that's the same for all four of these buttons. So if you press this button here, and the system and you had it in equalize and it doesn't go back to float then what you want to make sure is that the five volts is getting from there to that point there 
to make sure that the button is actually working and allowing the voltage to get through. You remember earlier we said that the alarm board will be on page two of the inverter drawing. Well, that is this down here. I think on the next page we go into explaining that. And then on the, uh, the control board here, we have all of these LEDs that can give you some indication of what may be going wrong with the board um, if necessary. And then you've got all our inputs coming in here and this is our communication um, going to the inverter control board. Okay, communications between the display board and the indicator board and communications going between the display alarm board to the relay interface board. Okay. And we didn't go into this, but we'll do it for the DPP. Um, and it, it works exactly the same. And this is the drawing for a remote manual bypass switch, which came with this UPS. OK, so once again, you've got our expanded uh, box down here, which has a serial number and it says sheet one of one. Everything is good. And this is a general outline of the remote bypass switch. OK, you can see uh, here. This is the terminals that you would connect your uh, loads to. So here is the neutral bus bar. That's where all the neutrals for this system get connected. Your bypass supply would be connected to uh, this one. Your output from the UPS. So let me let me start again. So the bypass input is that terminal up there. The normal source AC input 199 is that one there which comes from the UPS. So that's bypass up there. Okay. Um, 110, the line bypass source output that is up there. That is the bypass supply to the UPS. And then 810, that's this one here. That is the output that goes to your distribution board. OK, so that is all the hots or the lines for all of these supplies. All of the neutrals will be connected to that bus bar there. OK. The RMBS does have some alarm contacts in there, so you can take that to your control room and uh, uh, make the control room aware if there is some issues with the RMBS if necessary. That shows the handle, uh, the external uh, outline for uh, the system there, and then this shows you the LED mimic panel on the RMBS. And then this is the schematic diagram. Once again, I'll go through it quickly. We have bypass coming from your bypass transformer that goes back to your MCC. You have uh, your UPS output going in here. You have the system output going out here. And then this is the bypass to UPS, OK? So in normal operation, what happens is the UPS uh, will supply power out through the switch this way here, and the bypass will come this way here and go to the UPS and be ready when necessary to feed load down through this way here. What the switch allows us to do is it allows us to move the switch to the bypass position, which closes that contact there and allows bypass to go directly out this way here, which means we can isolate that, isolate that, and work on the UPS if necessary. And that's just a bigger drawing. You can see we have the switch handles here, and it tells you uh, position one, position two, and position three, and it denotes which position the switch contacts are closed. So this switch here, is closed when we're in position one, which is normal operation. This contact here is closed in either position two or position three. OK. And 
this contact up here is closed in position one and position two. So if we go to position two, okay, This one here will open, but before that opens, this one here will close, and this one up here remains closed. Okay? So that's how to work out what the bypass switch is doing. And there's a full schematic diagram showing you um, the box here is for UPS, and then the RMBS is here, and it shows you um, how they interconnect together, just exactly as I said. So the bypass from the bypass transformer here goes in here. The bypass then goes into the UPS. The output of the UPS comes out on here, and then this goes out to your load. Okay. And that's just the same drawing, but expanded. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the DPP uh, quickly. DPP is our pulse width modulation system. Um, rather than use a square wave on the inverter, it uses PWM to create a synthesized sine wave. And you can see this is the uh, outline drawing of the physical uh, attributes of the UPS. You can see that there is the display, the mimic screen here. Uh, we have our circuit breakers here. CB5 is the inverter output breaker. CB3 is the bypass input breaker. And CB1 is the AC input breaker, etc. Okay. Once again, everything remains the same. All of our drawings are standard, so they have the same boxes uh, in the bottom. And then this is um, the one-line one block diagram for the system, pretty much absolutely identical to the microferro system. Here's our startup and shutdown procedure, and here are our alarm connections. Okay, we'll go through each of those. So the block diagram, Explanatory, once again, it tells you what the currents, the maximum currents that we're going to see. So you have to make sure that your cables and MCC and distribution boards are able to handle those currents. Okay. And you can see over here, the terminals that you would connect to for your alarm circuits, excuse me. So this one here is loss of communication. If there was an internal communication loss and you wanted to alarm, you could connect to the common there. And if you're going to do it fail safe, it says under normal operation relay is energized. So that means it would be closed. We want to energize on open. So we would go to the normally open. Then that would close in normal operation when it's energized, and then if for any reason the alarm de-energized, then that would go to the normally open state and send a signal back to your MCs, I mean your DCS system. Every one of our systems has a uh, startup and shutdown procedure that was used at factory acceptance testing at the factory and has been rigorously tested. So if you follow the startup and shutdown procedures to the letter, then you shouldn't have an issue uh, when you shut down the system or start up the system. They have been tested um, at the factory. For the DPP, we don't have uh, push buttons on this system anymore. We do have a membrane keypad here, and it tells you what each of the uh, system does. Does sorry, this is a screen and these are our, our alarms. We do have an inverter enable switch. Remember on the microferro, I said that you had to close the DC input breaker or the battery input breaker to cause the inverter to come on. On the DPP, we do have an on off switch for the inverter, okay? This picture here um, for the microferro, you can remember that I said the terminals were at the bottom 
of the system. On the DPP, all of the connections are either on the breakers themselves, we have bus bar tabs coming off each breaker, or we have termination bars inside the UPS. Okay. And all of the details, the whole sizes, um, and et cetera, are listed there for you. I am trying to rush because I am uh, a little bit behind on this. There's a, uh, an expanded version of the, the Mimic screen, and it shows you the switch for the inverter enable uh, much better there, and it tells you what all the push buttons are on the Mimic. And then on a DPP, it does actually show you all of the alarms that you have on your system. Once again, this is a custom list that is um, generated for each and every UPS that we make. Some systems may not have uh, some of these alarms. Um, so the list can change from one UPS to another. And there's just a, a blown up version of that page. And here is the, um, the charger. Uh, for a DPP, it's pretty much identical to um, a microfarad charger, except for uh, the charger control board is now digital. It has fiber optic communications there, but we still have six SCRs. We still have a delta transformer. We do not need a neutral. We do not have a place to put a neutral. And then that goes into a star or a Y transformer here. It's exactly the same with the fuses there. Everything is exactly uh, the same. We have our inductor there, our fuses here. And then on this system, we have our capacitors inside the charger um, section on this system here. And this system, the DC goes into the inverter that way. And then our battery is connected here. Okay, you can see it better on the next page, I think. Yep. So that's our battery input breaker here. We do have a couple of things on the charger board that can do something. We have our thermostat on the charger heatsink. Um, that causes the charger to shut down if it gets too hot. Um, and we also have fuse indicators on this charger. So if any of these fuses here blew, that would cause this to close and would give a signal uh, to tell the system uh, that a fuse had blown. You would get a fuse blown uh, alarm on the mimic panel and it could go to your DCS as well. And then we also have our fan motors, sorry, our fan alarms connected here. The fan motors are connected here. And then for our inverter, this is our inverter page. Um, instead of using uh, IGB, two IGBTs and a center tapped transformer on the, the previous microfarad, on this system here, we are using four IGBTs in an H bridge arrangement. Okay. Um, you can see one, two, three, four IGBTs there. Okay. Um, it's difficult for me to draw on this one here because of my whiteboard again, but basically the power comes down. So this is positive and goes through this IGBT down to this point here. This IGBT will be off. So we will turn this IGBT on and this IGBT on and power will flow down here through this transformer back up to this point here, down here, and through this IGBT and out here. And it does that at eight kilohertz. And what we would actually do is we would get a pulse train of PWM like that with a peak voltage of the DC bus. And then what we would do is we would turn that IGBT off and that IGBT off, and then we would turn that IGBT on and that IGBT on. And basically, it would create the negative going pulse train with PWM, okay? And then that goes through TF2, which is a transformer, which generates a beautiful sine wave because there's filtering with that capacitor and there's inductance in the transformer as well, okay?
If we go around here once again, remember I mentioned to turn this inverter on, you have to turn SW2 on. That is the inverter enable switch on the front of the system. We have to have a closed signal going into the board to allow the inverter to start. If that doesn't happen, the inverter will never start. Okay. Um, we have this position indicator here, which tells us which position the battery input breaker is in. Okay. We have the same 105 volt for a 60 cell system shunt trip signal. This one is RLY1. And basically that closes this contact here, which shunt trip CB2, which is the battery input breaker and disconnects the battery to protect it from being over discharged at 105 volts DC for a 60 cell system. Um, our fan alarms come in here. Um, what else is that? That's really all we need to know. This is the uh, communi some communication alarms. We have fiber optic alarms uh, here. That's pretty much all there is to know about the inverter bridge. And then here is the static switch. So uh, we'll expand that. So this is once again, very similar to the microfarad. Um, the inverter output goes on this system. It has a breaker on the inverter output. Some systems don't. So this is the inverter static switch. So power would normally flow through here out to this point here and out to the load. And then if we press the bypass to load button, that would be disconnected. But before that happens, this would be turned on and would allow power to flow through that way there. So when we say static bypass, that means either the system itself has turned this static switch on or somebody has pressed the bypass to load button and turned this switch on. Remember, it has no moving parts. That's why it's called static switch. It is instantaneous. It does it without any break whatsoever. Okay. And then here are the control boards within the DPP itself. Uh, if we blow that up a little bit, you can see um, Here's the relay board here. And once again, we've got common, normally open, normally closed. And it tells you for every alarm under normal condition, not under shelf condition, under normal condition, it's saying that the relay is energized. So for loss of communication, if we had a, a loss of communication error, then this would de-energize. So for alarm, it would de-energize, okay? And each and every alarm will tell you what it does. Uh, let me see if there's anything else on here. Um, these connections here are digital inputs. Basically, the one on the left is CB1 AUX. It tells the system if AC input breaker is closed. The next one along is the bypass input breaker. It tells the system whether the bypass input breaker is closed or not. And then the next one is the inverter output breaker. It tells the system if that is open or closed. And that is reflected on the mimic screen as well. And this is just a blown up drawing of the alarms. So the common alarm is the most common um, connection back to a DCS system. So it's saying under normal operation, the relay is energized. Now for a fail safe, I'm gonna repeat this, for a fail safe system, that means you have to have a normally open signal going back to the DCS for failure, okay? So that means we need to have a normally closed signal going back to the DCS for healthy. So that means we would connect our alarm signals to the common and are normally open because if there's normal operation and there's no alarms, that will be closed, okay? It's only when this de-energizes because of an alarm that would then open, that would send a signal back to the DCS and tell it that there is a problem, okay?
Okay. And this section here is just the power supplies for the system. Unfortunately, I've run out of time and I'm not going to have time to go over this. Um, if you want to check back, I did this presentation about a year ago, exactly a year ago, and it will be in the YouTube library. You can go in there and see what my explanation of that was. And that's just an expanded um, version of the power supply and the fans. So now we get to any questions. Goodness me. I'm exhausted after all of that. I told you I speak too much. <laughs> so at this moment here, are there any questions on what we have discussed? Um, I'll give you a few moments to ask any questions. And while I wait for any questions to come in, um, I'd like to remind you that, yes, this webinar was recorded so it will be uploaded to our youtube channel tomorrow it does take time for the marketing department to do that you can see the link in the chat bar if you click on that youtube link it takes you to our channel and you can view all the videos that we've made um, on that channel um, another question is asked is can people get a copy of the presentation no we do not give um the pd a PDF or a PowerPoint uh, version of the presentation is proprietary, um, but we have no issues at all with you sharing the YouTube link if that's what you want to do. You will, as part of being registered for this webinar, receive a survey. Um, and I read every single one of those surveys and I really ask you to send them back just for the question that asks, what would you like us to do the next webinar on? I really want to find out more about what the engineers and anybody else who are watching these videos, what they want me to discuss at our next webinar, and then I'll create a presentation um, to accommodate that. So please don't think that it won't be heard if you do fill out the survey and type in what you want the next presentation to be about. I do read every single one of them. So um, please do take the time to let me know what you want me to discuss next. So it seems like there is no questions coming in. So either I have confused the heck out of everybody and spoke too fast, or um, I gave you some good information and I, you don't need clarity on it. So what I would say is this is the final webinar of 2022. So the next time I'm going to speak to you is in 2023. So look out for the email that comes along there. Um, London has put in the chat by there. If you need to contact us, she's given you the contact us web link. You can email us at sci.marketing at amatech.com. Or if you're old fashioned and you want to pick up the phone, not a problem. You can call 1-800-635-7300. Somebody will pick up the phone and give you some technical help. So until next time, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and it was of interest to you. Um, I wish everybody out there a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, whatever you celebrate at this uh, portion of the year. Um, I really wish you... Um, a wonderful time over the festive period, and I look forward to speaking to you in 2023. Until then, take care, everybody, and thanks for watching.